Good evening, nine. afternoon, and uh, good morning, depending where you're coming from. I guess maybe not morning, but uh, wherever you're tuning in from today, we're so happy to have you. We have such a thrilling presentation coming uh, to you today from uh, our friends over at Perfuse MedTech. We want to thank them for the support for making this education today possible. And we have a, a, an amazing guest speaker today we'll introduce in just a second. Today's topic is going to be on the Wound Bed Prep 2024 and uh, before we get started, as you all know, one of my favorite icebreaker games is to just click on that chat tool in your Zoom toolbar and uh, introduce yourself. I see people are already putting messages in there. Hi from Regina, Alberta, Timmins, Quebec, Saskatchewan, everywhere. Lovely. Um, so my name is Troy. I'm the Director of Operations for Nurses Specialized in Wound Ostomy and Continence Canada. Uh, and I'm tuning in from Ottawa, Ontario here. So joining us today is our, our guest speaker, Dr. R. Gary Sibold. Uh, many of you may have uh, heard him speak before, and he was at our NSWAC conference last year. He'll be there again this year. And uh, Dr. Sibel is the lead project of, uh, uh, sorry, lead of Project Echoes Ontario Skin and Wound. He's a dermatologist and an internist with a special interest in wound care and education. He's a professor of medicine and public health at the University of Toronto. And as a wound care educator, uh, clinician, and clinical researcher, he is also an international wound care opinion leader. Dr. Sybil is also the co-founder and course director of the International Interprofessional Wound Care Course, or IIWCC, and he's the director of the Master of Science in Community Health Prevention and Wound Care at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Dr. Sybil is also the former president of the World Union of Wound Healing Societies from 2008 to 2012. He's a co-editor and chapter author of the Chronic Wound Care textbook, and he has over 200 publications as uh, the current co-editor of the journal Advances in Skin and Wound Care. So without further ado, I'm so happy to pass over the mic and the screen to Dr. Sybil. Thanks, Dr. Sybil. And I think we're just on mute there. If we can get uh, Dr. Sybil unmuted. Okay, thanks, Troy. Uh, I am off mute. This is an exciting time, and we will look at Wound Bed Prep 2024, which will be published as of April 1st, next Monday. And you can go to www.woundcarejournal.com and uh, download a copy. And here you see my speaker disclosures. Um, it's really Government of Ontario for Project ECHO two days a week, and um, I have done work for Perfuse, which I am going to talk about, uh, the Gecko device and chymoseptine. Uh, next slide. I want to take uh, leg and foot ulcers and look at how you should be able to handle most of these ulcers and patients uh, within your own constituency in your own clinic. And I'm going to review the audible handheld Doppler versus a traditional ABPI. And we have a toolkit, which you'll see shortly, uh, that uh, is available to people that go through uh, Project ECHO and through skills examinations. And we hope to make it available to people across the country uh, through donations. We will look at the vascular Doppler. So the VIPs are vascular infection and plantar pressure redistribution. So I'm going to talk about this. And then I'm going to integrate new techniques into practice, including the gecko device. Next. Next. Yep. This is the new, whoops, go back one. This is the new wound bed prep paradigm. And as you see, uh, treatment of the cause uh, and uh, patient-centered concerns are number one and two. And these are numbered one through 10 and represent a comprehensive approach to wound care. Uh, the third one is the ability to heal, healable maintenance and non-healable. About two thirds are healable, 25% maintenance and the remainder non-healable. Uh, we look at local wound care, the documentation, through debridement, infection inflammation, and moisture management. Not all patients have moisture balance. Then we look at the healing trajectory, and if it's not meeting targets, uh, then you really should look at an interprofessional consult, biopsies, special procedures. Then we have the edge effect for advanced or adjunctive therapies, usually for a healable wound that's stalled. 
And number 10 is looking at the healthcare system. And there are often more disturbances and more problems with the healthcare system than the training of healthcare professionals. Uh, for the first time, this is our seventh iteration of wound bed prep. It started in Canada in the year 2000 uh, with an advisory board. 2003, it went international. World Health Organization picked it up in 2006. We had iterations in 2011, 2015, and uh, 2021 prior to this one. This is a consensus of 41 key opinion leaders around the world. And on the 10 statements and substatements, uh, the lowest score was 88% consensus of strongly agree or somewhat agree with the recommendations that I will highlight uh, during this presentation. Next slide. So diabetes priority in developing or low resource country settings, the highest priority is cost saving and highly feasible. And this includes uh, foot care if high risk. So doing a foot screen and identifying the high risk foot. Glycemic control hemoglobin A1C under nine. Canada's guidelines are under seven. At the end of the presentation, you'll see the World Health Organization is aiming at eight. And uh, we have some patients, if they're prone to hypoglycemia, we might allow an 8.4. And uh, you'll see the third thing down there is blood pressure, less than 160 over 95. But we know if you've got adequate resources, 120 over 80 will prevent strokes. Next. Here is what happened after primary care reform in Ontario as government priorities changed. Uh, we went to Guiana, South America and with a CETA grant, um, really were able to accomplish looking at the OR in the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation, 68% reduction in amputations by looking 43 months before our intervention in 2008 and 43 months after. We developed a simplified 60-second screening tool that actually takes 60 seconds, and we've saved the uh, more complex tools, and uh, we have really saved them for foot care specialists. We created a center of excellence where, for the first time, doctors, nurses, and allied health we're working together and we're still working on doing this in Ontario. We created seven satellite diabetic foot centers and we're going to create satellite hubs with Project Echo Ontario Skin and Wounds. Key opinion leader training was with the International Interprofessional Wound Care Course and 15 healthcare professionals in Guyana went through this. And for the first time we had interprofessional collaboration. On the male and female surgical wards, the diabetic foot amputations were the most common admissions. Um, they had a rehab uh, group downstairs um, that had 11 employees, and there was only one rehab consult in the two years pre us going and doing this project. Next. And we developed this simplified 60-second tool the nurses would go uh, through the diabetic clinics every Thursday morning, and all the patients were booked at 8 o'clock, and they would go down the aisles and do the foot screens. And they did 1,266 consecutive uh, persons with diabetes. And you'll see at the bottom, if you press this twice, Troy, 9% uh, of them actually had an active ulcer they weren't paying attention to. Uh, but referred to the diabetic foot center, 48%. So in one minute, we could cut and uh, focus on the high-risk individuals. And depending on the risk level, uh, we could determine how soon we needed to see them. Next one. And this is all published in PLOS. Let's look at this 60-second screen. It may be a little bit um, low volume, but... Uh, Try and listen intently, but you'll see that I can do this in 60 seconds. Okay, Troy. Simplify 2012, 60 second. Have you had a previous ulcer? No. Amputation? No. On exam, look for deformity. 
callus, blister, linear crack, or fissure. Check the toex because there may be a crack or fissure. Look on the dorsal surface, look at the nail folds for any thickening or ingrown nail folds. Then feel or palpate dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial pulse. Do you feel this? Yes. Using the monofilament, tell me when you feel it. Yes. 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 And you're bending it just to form a C, and you're pressing only once. Two negatives, we need four or more negatives for a positive test. Remember to do the other foot. Okay, and that was, we have a version which shows that that was done in about 54 seconds, and it can easily be done very quickly. Next slide. Simplify. And we had plantar pressure redistribution with the cheap and cheerful that are not covered in many of the healthcare systems in Canada. And you can see here selection of Darko boots and very simple plantar pressure redistribution. We had a few more complex devices. Next. And in Canada, we might pay $150 to $200 for some of these devices, and contact casting costs even more. In Guyana, we were using half shoes, which we don't use so much now, or uh, post-surgical or all-purpose boots. Each of them, uh, Darko, are $20 to $25. Press again, Troy. 250 patients were treated for less than 7,000 Canadian dollars. So this is the way on the next slide, which we can take reverse innovation, and there's a whole book on this. There is a Wikipedia um, uh, actual connotation on it. It's a trickle-up innovation first in the developing world, inexpensive models repackaged for the developed world. And this is how... Uh, the portable Doppler was developed, but we have had uh, beachheads in Guyana, South America, South Africa, Ethiopia, and I think we've learned enough that we can bring it back home. Next. This is the new wound bed prep uh, 2024. You can see treat the cause, and then I'm going to uh, hone in on arterial display supply, and the audible handheld Doppler. Patient-centered concerns, really important that the patient's central to this and patient empowerment. And when I talk at the end of the talk about virtual education, and I talk about patient navigation, uh, you'll see how uh, we're able to incorporate the patient as an active participant. Finding the healability, and a healable wound is going to have a very different local wound care journey than a maintenance or a non-healable wound. If you flip down to infection and inflammation, this is where the infrared thermometer is very important. And uh, very soon we'll introduce the therapeutic index. But we also know now that for even osteomyelitis, often oral antibiotics are equivalent to intravenous antibiotics, and this may help treatment within your local community and not having to have people in northern remote isolated and indigenous communities being flown out. And I will talk about system change and how ECHO will help facilitate that. And you see the rest of the wound bed prep paradigm there. Next slide. ECHO and we've been at this for five years, and as an extension for community health care outcomes, this came out of New Mexico and San Aurora hepatitis C, successfully treated 120 in his own clinic, but through his spokes and echo 180 more. And this is published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. And there are now 2,000 echoes around the world we happen to be the only skin and wounds so far. Next one. It's moving knowledge, not patience, and listen to this. Yep, go on to the next one. 
Let's play it. Project Echo is a performance optimizer. Think of it as a high-speed internet connection for the healthcare system. It spreads new medical knowledge throughout the healthcare system, from university medical centers and other specialty care sites, to the front lines of community care. Rather than information flowing in one direction, community providers learn from specialists. They learn from each other, and specialists learn from community providers as new best practices emerge. Under ECHO, community providers use video technology to participate in guided practice with specialist mentors. They acquire new skills that allow them to treat patients they otherwise would have referred out. Patients with complex chronic conditions get high quality care where they live from providers they know. No waiting months to see a specialist. No long drives back and forth to get critical care. ECHO exponentially increases access to specialty care by moving knowledge instead of moving patients. Suffering and pain are reduced and lives are improved and even saved. Project ECHO, changing the world fast. Join us at echo.unm.edu. Are you part of the ECHO? And this project has, next slide, uh, has about $100 million in funding. And it's very different from telemed. And why is it different? Uh, the ECHO model's not the same where the main goal is to improve access by using technology to bridge distance. ECHO improves capacity and access simultaneously. And cases are discussed anonymously. We put them in the wound bed prep paradigm format. They are presented. Other spokes uh, within ECHO comment, and we're trying to encourage doctor, nurses, and allied health to work together. And responsibility of care for the patients is not transferred uh, to the specialist. It remains in the community with their own medical teams. Next one. This is our Woundpedia hub, and two of the nurses there, Sunita and Pat, have both been with me between Women's College and the Mississauga Clinic since 1985. And you can see Lori Goodman, you can see Dr. Zhao, uh, Renika, um, all part of the uh, core uh, team in ECHO. And there's about over 190 years of wound care experience in this core. Next one, and Laura Lee Cazzotti as the Chiropodus. We are partners with NSWOC, nurses specializing in wound ostomy in Continence Canada. Kathy Harley and I uh, first met at Mississauga Hospital in the 80s, and I followed her for her Convitec days, um, both in Canada and then internationally. Uh, Kim is a graduate, as is Kathy of the I IWCC, and Kim is going on to be uh, the president of the Canadian Nursing Association, has done a lot of work in skin tears. And Erin Rahathi is an RN, and she is our current ECHO representative from NSWOC uh, to uh, the ECHO program. Next one. Our other partner and accreditor is Queen's University. Karen Smith and I have worked together. She is a physiatrist. She adds the pressure injury expertise, Jolene Nile, uh, pressure injury expertise and pain. We have two PhD educators, Nancy uh, Delgarno, um, actually does our evaluation and uh, Terry uh, does our needs assessment and accreditation. And we have a pediatrician who is the uh, vice dean. Next one. We know in Ontario uh, that Northern Ontario has three times the rate of diabetic foot amputations than the greater uh, Toronto area, which is in green there. Uh, but we have many regions in between uh, with two times and one time uh, in the uh, orange and the yellow. 
And I think that uh, we can do a lot better. And in fact, between 2015 and 2020, uh, some of the statistics show the amputation rate has actually increased. Some of these people are living longer and they're getting more complications. Next slide. We also know uh, that the long-term survival after major uh, lower extremity amputations, low for all people, but even lower for the First Nations. And in fact, David Armstrong has shown uh, that uh, the five-year survival after even an amputation of a toe is worse than breast cancer in females, prostate cancer in males, or lymphoma overall. On the next slide, we are working uh, with the next uh, May Wassing uh, family health team, which is an all Indigenous team. And uh, Nicole is actually my office manager in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, she is First Nations. Jose Senecal is a graduate of the I IWCC in our master's program at U of T, which she could take from Sudbury uh, during the pandemic. And uh, you also see Amy Esposito. Jose is an NSWOC, but uh, uh, she's also in charge of their limb preservation program and shared their 72-page document with me. Uh, Amy Esposito is a nurse practitioner, spent some time observing in my office there. Rachel Aniswasis is a dermatologist trained in Toronto, working in Regina First Nations. Her father is a... Um, uh, is an actual survivor of the residential schools. He's an original professor of the uh, Indigenous University of Canada and Blair Stonechild, and has written about the loss of the Indigenous Eden. He's uh, written also a life history of Buffy St. Marie. And he has helped us with micro-credentials and came with Rachel to Sault St. Marie. Uh, Jeremy Call is an NSWAC nurse. He is working for Indigenous Services Canada. He is in Sioux Lookout, and he is also a uh, part of our ECHO broadcast as core faculty. Next slide. I want to show you how we can make vascular easy in your community, uh, the diagnosis and treatment of infection better, and planter pressure redistribution uh, cheap and cheerful. On the next slide, uh, palpating for a dorsalis pedis pulse, uh, but you can't record palpating a pulse, okay? And about 8% of people have an aberrant posterior tibial, and you may have to look at the perineal or the posterior, uh, the um, other pulses around the ankles. Next. This is just, if you've got a palpable pulse, you've got 80 millimeters of mercury or more, ankle brachial pressure index should be between 0 0.5 and less than 1.4. Those are new figures from American Heart. Audible handheld Doppler, and we uh, did 200 consecutive patients in our office and compared it to um, a gold standard vascular lab at Trillium Mississauga. And if we heard a biphasic, which is psh, 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 or triphasic, psh, 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 uh, we knew there was adequate blood supply to heal. And the audible handheld Doppler ABPI is greater than or equal 0.9. Transcutaneous oxygen is also difficult, not covered in Ontario anymore. Takes a uh, uh, good 20 minutes to recalibrate this uh, from the chest down to the leg. And you want a value greater than 30 with 40, greater than 40 being normal. And it measures the large vessels, small vessels, uh, any edema, the temperature of the skin, and vasoconstriction or dilation from drugs. Toe pressure, uh, you want 30 to 55 millimeters of mercury for healing. And the great toe doesn't have enough adventitial tissue for complete calcification. Let's look at the next slide. 
What we see here is the accuracy of the audible handheld Doppler, and it's very specific. It can rule out peripheral vascular disease. And um, you see here, the figure is really quite high that for the posterior tibial, it's 98.6% um, in agreement, and dorsalis pedis is 97.8. But always look, make sure there isn't dependent rubber, and when you elevate the foot, it doesn't go white, and make sure uh, that the foot isn't cold in comparison to the other foot, or abnormally cold when you've got bilateral disease. It's not good at identifying the disease where you need a sequential Doppler. And if you get, you can't get the pulse with the Doppler, uh, you, and you hear a monophasic pulse, shh, 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 then they need a complete uh, lower limb arterial uh, sequential uh, Doppler exam that measures each segment and can identify potential bypassable or dilatable lesions. And when you look at uh, the positive and negative predictive values, they're good. So the audible handheld Doppler is reliable, simple, rapid, and inexpensive bedside exclusion test in diabetic and non-diabetic subjects. So you don't have to fly somebody uh, from a remote area, say to Thunder Bay. Uh, Dr. McDonald can uh, palpate the pulse and send them back home and you've got a $10,000 airfare. Uh, you can actually, on the next slide, the audible handheld Doppler, the patient can be sitting in a chair. There is no pain from squeezing the calf muscle, which is why some of the patients couldn't have a complete test. It's not influenced by calcified vessels. This is really important. So any multiphasic, biphasic, or triphasic wave will result in an audible handheld Doppler value equivalent to or equal ABPI greater than or equal 0 0.9. Monophasic or absent waves shh, 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 uh, should trigger a sequential duplex arterial Doppler in the vascular lab. And you can send an audio tape, MB3 or even MB4, as verification, and this can be attached to the patient's healthcare record. So you can start compression right away uh, after the assessment. Next slide. I want you to listen to this signal, and I want you to vote. Uh, Troy, we're all set with the votes. Yeah, yep, there it goes. Just go. yeah. Listen to the it. signal and tell us whether... Here's our luscious peak. Sorry about that. We're going to hear it again. Is it a distinct sound or are you hearing a muzzled sound? Play it one more time and then let's see the vote. Let's uh, see the vote. Okay, and Troy, why don't you read that out? I'm sitting far from the screen. Sure thing. So uh, in order, we have that 57% uh, uh, of participants have chosen biphasic. 16% have chosen multiphasic, so biphasic or triphasic. And 12% uh, as a tie, 12% for both triphasic and monophasic, with only 2% saying unable to determine the sound. Okay, let's go on to the next one, and we'll come back and play this sound again. Let's go and listen to this one. Play it one more time. 
Okay, let's see the votes this time. And this time we're looking at 62% are saying triphasic, 19% are saying biphasic, 11% are saying multiphasic, and then 4% for monophasic with only 3% saying unable to determine. So 93% of you got a correct answer here. And you could hear the psh, psh, psh. It's a little bit of a fast pulse, so it's harder. 93% of you got it right. And the other people, if you would have felt the foot and held it up and put it down and uh, seen whether you could feel a pulse, would have had. Let's go back to the first one again. Let's listen to this one. Okay, and it takes a little bit of knowing to get this, but this is monophasic. And it is a woo, 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 woo. You don't have a distinct second or third sound coming. So the next time through, I'm going to be quiet or shut up and let's listen to it again. Play it one more time. Okay, really good. 93% of it got it once you heard um, a multiphasic sound. So it's not that hard to learn. There's lots of practice methods on the web. It was Dieter Meyer, an internationally uh, key opinion leader that used to at the Beath Symposium in New York run the wound care session that I spoke at many times. And I think this is really um, a useful, useful tool. And it gets away from the calcified vessel, et cetera. Let's go on to slides. Okay, this is our toolkit. And the toolkit contains footwear. Uh, people get 12 uh, pieces of footwear. Once uh, the foot program is set up in the screen and um, uh, you get uh, the post-surgical boot, the Darko, you want footwear that's wide enough. Uh, you want it having a backing and you want Velcro or lace. You've got plastisoporon poron that you can cut to the shape of the shoe if you're using another shoe or the shape of this uh, device and you can do fine tuning with the uh, felt and foam. We've also got an infrared thermometer that any of you can buy for 20 to 50 Canadian dollars, and I'll show you how valuable it is. And uh, you've got uh, scissors and everything you need as well as enablers for practice. And it comes in a nice box. Next one. This is the Levine technique. And when you're taking a swab, clean the wound first, but it's gotta be non-bacteriostatic saline or water or potable water. And um, you're going to debride slough. You're gonna sample only if there are signs or symptoms of infection. And tissue samples are preferred with a curette. But if you're sampling, you look for relatively normal skin, uh, so it's pink and firm. You press till you just extract a little fluid and rotate 360 degrees. You can actually increase your yield by putting it in the transport media first. Uh, you can actually increase your yield uh, by doing that and then doing the swab 360 degrees. Next slide. What's the purpose of a bacterial swab? And uh, you may have to uh, move this over if it's uh, where it is on mine. And um, is it to diagnose infection one, detect the antibiotic resistance, direct antimicrobial treatment, all of the above, all of the above except diagnose infection. Let's vote.
And looks like we're about 70% participated. Do you want me to share the results? Yeah, that sounds good. And maybe you All can right. read them out to me. Will do. So uh, the majority, 54% are saying all of the above. 32% say all of the above except to diagnose infection. 9% uh, to direct antimicrobial treatment. 4% to diagnose infection. And 1% uh, to de detect antibiotic resistance. Okay. I want everybody who didn't say uh, two and three um, uh, to write down infection is diagnosed clinically. A swab will detect antibiotic resistance and help to direct antimicrobial treatment by identifying the organisms. And a week later, when the patient's not getting better, you'll have some useful data. But you don't need to do this in everybody. And tissue samples, if you're doing any curetting, are actually better. But you don't want to send slough or debris. Next one. If you haven't seen the updated definition and concepts of infection in the International Wound Infection Institute 2022, this is freely downloadable just by Googling the International uh, Wound Infection Institute. And on the next slide, here's their new terminology. And, you know, organisms are present. So you may pick up on a swab contamination. Colonizations, when they're present, and you've got limited uh, proliferation, but there's no surface tissue damage. When you have surface tissue damage, this is called covert or subtle infection, and you're going to have three or more NERDS criteria. And this is where topical antisepsis, not antibiotics, and they're much more likely the topical antibiotics, your polysporins, even your fusidin and bactroban, about 8% of people get sensitized to these. And uh, you're my, and they don't do uh, moisture management, and they only need one mutation for resistance. Um, spreading or overt classical infection, I should say, three or more stonies, systemic antibiotics or antimicrobials. And if the spreading infections got crepitus, lymphagitis, and nodes, uh, you may need the intravenous antibiotics. And if you've got systemic infection signs such as malaise, lethargy, sepsis, shock, and even death, well, you know, this is really a medical emergency. So the International Wound Infection Institute practice point, consider wound infection in the presence of multiple indicative signs and symptoms rather than the presence of any individual sign or symptom. And this is how NERDS and Stonies came about. And um, the Infection Institute has, um, in fact, um, incorporated that as one of their suggested ways of diagnosing and monitoring infection. Next one. And uh, local infection is like a thin layer of soup in a soup bowl with the sides and the bottom. And um, the thin layer of soup, local infection, non-healing, the length and width hasn't changed, but it's not getting bigger. Exudate and smell uh, come from the center of the wound. And exudate is a response to injury. And it's mild, moderate, severe, or uh, copious. And it's either serous from serum it's sanguinous from blood, or it's pustular. And you always put the predominant element first, like serosanguinous, mostly serum with a tinge of blood, or serosanguinous pustular, there's a tinge of blood and a few little flakes of pus. Red and bleeding tissue, bacteria produce VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. You take a dressing off and you see those red punctate bleeding points. We didn't realize that that was harmful. Uh, probably in the 90s when we started to look at skin substitutes. 
Debris is dead tissue, and smell usually means gram negatives or anaerobes. Stonies is the soup bowl. There's four on the side and three on the bottom. Size is bigger, it's moving out. Increased temperature around the wound. And you get new areas of breakdown satellites, and they often join up to the main wound. And erythema and edema is known as cellulitis. Why are they grouped together? Because in skin of color, it may be very hard to see erythema or redness, but you'll see edema or you'll see some hyperpigmentation and it may be warm to the touch. Exudate and smell are in both, okay, so that you have to remember uh, that and find additional nerds criteria to treat topically or additional Stoney's criteria to treat systemically. Pain is a symptom, not a sign. Increased pain localized in the wound without another cause can count uh, as a substitute for one of the signs. Next one. These are just, see the friable tissue? Three out of the four have got uh, maceration around the wound and uh, that indicates uh, increased moisture exudate. Uh, there is some slough uh, in a couple of those, especially the left upper one, and uh, the green pyrocyanin of Pseudomonas. And if you spelled it once, you will not forget it. Next one. And this was uh, looking at uh, factor analysis, three or more. Uh, was uh, three was very sensitive and specific. As you go down, the sensitivity goes down and the specificity goes up. Next. And this is where honey, slow release iodine, silver, PHMB, chlorhexidine, or hydrofera blue might be things you would use. Next slide. And this is the um, biofilm formation. How successful are the following to eradicate biofilms? Honey, iodine, silver, PHMB, chlorhexidine, or other agents. And you see that you get single organisms, contamination, colonization, they start cooperating. And with a biofilm, they form a glycocalyx. So at any time, some bacteria can be resting. As they build up to larger structures, they often give off planktonic forms, which is why you can get recurrent infections. And two surfaces of different viscosity may be more very important in terms of recurrent infections. Next one. Here it is, non-healable or maintenance wounds tissue debridement of the slough, but bacterial reduction and moisture reduction. Moisture balance and active debridement is contraindicated. Topical antiseptics will decrease bacterial counts. Bacterial surface counts help decrease, help to decrease uh, the penetration into the deeper tissue. And there are some agents better than others on the next slide. Uh, chlorhexidine, Povidone iodine, hydrochlorous acid um, are very good in terms of low toxicity, and it's either a pH effect or effect on cell membrane, mitochondria, or DNA, and helps us. Saline or water are neutral. Dyes like scarlet red proflavin, sodium hypochloride, which is bleach, and it can be toxic. Uh, hydrogen peroxide works with the fizz and quaternary ammonia have a high toxicity. And selecting out gram negatives from dyes or toilet water. Uh, so antiseptics are good, and uh, but they're only needed uh, when bacterial burden is more important. Next. Here's the deep ones, the stonies. And you can see the satellites, especially in the upper left. You can see the uh, probing to bone uh, you can see the cellulitis around them. And on the lower right, when I took that nail off, this was a neurotrophic foot, clamp a needle driver on it, and turn it 90 degrees, 
and there was exposed bone underneath where the hint of pus is. And you can see the cellulitis in uh, the two on the right and the probing to bone on the right. Next. And these 90% sensitive and uh, stays with the, um, for three and with the persons with diabetes and still pretty specific. And especially as you go up to four signs. Next. But the biggest thing is temperature. It was eight times more likely to indicate deep and surrounding infection compared, not an absolute number, but compared to a three degree Fahrenheit on the other limb. And this is because three degrees Fahrenheit uh, translates in Celsius to a fraction number, and it's much harder to calculate that. Next. So there's your nerds and stonies, and um, it's a very useful tool, and I'll show you how useful uh, towards the end of the talk. Next one. Next. And this is the team uh, that did patient navigation. And uh, this team was a special team, Helen Arpathanathan, along with uh, Jane Dial, and um, along with Douglas Queen. And what we did in the patient navigation, and this is a plant blooming in my garden now, it's called a Christmas rose or Helioborus, and even the snow in it was covered in snow earlier this week, and it's fine. Next. What we did was we took 48 clients during COVID. I had my arm twisted. And some of them, these are the train wrecks or the 20% of patients that make up 80% of the cost. And we had the NSWAC nurse go in and do the wound bed prep 2021, which is very similar to the 2024, except the 2024 is aimed at resource limited environments. And uh, they had a report uh, which they put into their electronic record. They presented it to me uh, connected on Teams uh, with the patient in their home, patient family member, the primary nurse in the home, myself and the NSWAC nurse. And in those 48 clients, uh, we actually healed 29% of them. 66% were smaller. Over 70% had less nursing visits and less supply usage. 80% using nerds and stonies got either a superficial, deep, or both diagnosis and treatment of infection that wasn't fully recognized before. And 73%, and even though pain wasn't a big issue in all of them, had better pain control. So I think this is something that we can look at as cost effective and we're hoping through ECHO uh, that we can perpetuate this further. Next slide. Here's the World Health Organization targets for 2030. And what you see in those targets, and James Elliott from our group is now with the World Health Organization and one of the five people working on these targets, and he's in charge of um, external organizations networking with them. But currently, there's about 40% of people with diabetes diagnosed with it, and they're going for 80%. And the biggest lesson to all of us is anybody with a leg ulcer below the knee or anybody that isn't making a target with an ulcer should have a hemoglobin A1C. And in our um, assessment that we did in Mississauga Halton, where we measured hemoglobin A1Cs on over 100 clients, the incidence of diabetes in Mississauga Halton is 9%. The incidence we got in this group was 34%. So it was almost four times higher. The second thing is glycemic control, and I referred to this, the number eight, which is in between uh, what uh, developing country targets were and what the Canadian one is at seven. And uh, blood pressure control. And again, this is a higher number of 140 over 90. 
What we aren't measuring in our patients is lipids being treated with a statin, and they're trying to get that up to 60%, and medicine availability. And this is a very sad story. University of Toronto uh, donated insulin for $1. Uh, the two co-creators, uh, Dr. McLeod and uh, Dr. Banting. And unfortunately, there is very little generic insulin in Africa. So one vial of insulin uh, costs about two weeks of wages for many people. And most people with type 1 diabetes that need insulin actually die prematurely in Africa. And this is something that James, before he went with World Health, uh, was with T1 International, type 1 diabetes. And uh, we came up with insulin for all and saving limbs and saving lives based on this uh, for Africa back in 2012. And those projects are still going. And with Professor Whiteside, my former Dean of Medicine at U of T, and Associate Professor Val Rack, uh, we're starting to collaborate with World Health. Next. We're now gonna move on to the Gecko device, next one. Next slide. And this is a device that is positioned um, around the fibular head to simulate the common perineal nerve. It's 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Each device lasts two days. Three electrodes provide comfort and ease of fitting and uh, 10 levels of stimulation. Wristwatch size, battery operated. And you see a picture there. Next slide. Here's a typical trajectory of a venous ulcer. And this is from a random controlled trial with about 40 patients in each uh, leg of the trial, probably more correct than arm. Uh, week zero to four, everybody got compression. At week four, if the ulcers weren't significantly smaller, they were randomized uh, from uh, week four to week eight uh, to receive the gecko device or just the standard of care. And those getting the gecko device got uh, the standard of care, which was compression therapy and the gecko. The ones that just got standard of care did not get a gecko device, but that was only from week four to week eight. Next slide. What is the gecko and what does it do? And we do know that gecko increased speckle imaging of peak venous velocity over baseline. And how much do you think it increased the velocity? If you think it increased it by 50% vote one, 100% vote two, three green greater than 150%, vote three, four greater than 200%, blue by 200% only when combined with compression therapy. So let's see your vote. Oh, we're okay. already at about 50% now, so I'll share these results. All right. You want me to read them off for you? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Troy. Perfect. So a little bit more um, across the board here. 30% say by two, over 200% only when combined with compression therapy. It then goes to 28% saying over 150%. Then 22% saying over 100%. 13% say over 50%. And then uh, at the bottom, it's 6% for over 200%. Okay, uh, let's look at the slide. Next slide. And play the uh, gecko off. So this is the baseline. And this is speckle imaging of um, a venous ulcer region. And you can see that there's... Uh, uh, with each uh, arterial beat, there is uh, some increased perfusion. Let's go over, and this is without compression. Let's do the next, uh, the next segment. Okay, and this is over 200, even without 
uh, compression therapy. Uh, so it can really increase local perfusion. And on the next slide, this is uh, the results uh, from Keith Harding's study. Healing rate was twice as fast when the gecko was added to the standard of care. And there was a 2.2-fold increase in the healing rate over standard of care alone. Now, what's really interesting on the next slide is that this increased healing continued from week 8 to 12, even without the gecko device. Uh, so that we didn't need to continually uh, stimulate the calf muscle pump. And this is a myo uh, nerve stimulator. And I think what we're seeing is that that increased perfusion has done enough locally uh, to have the effect persist even after the device was taken off. Now, here's another interesting twist to this device. Let's look at the next slide. This is your last vote. After the kidney and pancreas and or it's kidney plus or minus pancreas, the muscle pump activator device. Now, if you think it decreased urine output, so it can be single ones, one, two, six, or it can be combinations, or number one is all of the above. Did it increase urine output? Decrease leg edema, minimize weight gain, fewer delays in incisional wound healing, reduce complex wound infections. If it's just one, two, and three, increase your output, decrease leg edema, uh, minimize weight gain. If it's just those three, both seven. And if it's just fewer delays in incisional wound healing and reduce complex wound infections, vote eight. And if it's all of the above, vote one. I want at least 50% here, Troy, and uh, participate. Uh, this is what, you know, will give you a, a far greater experience um, out of this uh, session. So I really would like you to uh, participate as much as possible. All right. And I think it's a... You're 50? Okay, I'll take it. All righty. So the uh, results should now be showing, whoops, should now be showing now. A majority of 50% of people are saying all the options below. 27% say options one, two, and three. 10% say options five and six. And then it goes down to uh, much smaller numbers for each of the other options with decreased leg edema being four uh, percent. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is even better um, and uh, collective uh, study results. And uh, there were uh, in this study, I forget the exact number, but around two hundred and forty uh, patients. And um, uh, the results are quite startling in that all of those uh, parameters were um, actually um, improved or increased. Uh, so that is, I think, a pretty remarkable result all the way around, and that was without compression. Uh, so it's obviously mobilizing fluid in a way uh, that you don't have to use a lot of diuretics or you don't have to use a lot of compression or make the patients feel uncomfortable in order to get the kind of results that you want in this patient group. And, you know, post-transplants, they often have fluids monitored every 20 minutes and uh, it can be quite an ordeal. Next. So, what are the conclusions from this segment? And I think the uh, that gecko uh, plus standard of care venous leg ulcers heal, but they heal at two times the rate uh, than standard of care alone uh, with the gecko. 
Daily device adherence was very high, so it wasn't bothering patients, almost 95%. Reported pain was reduced with the gecko devices. Transplant oper, um, observations reduced post renal and pancreas, plus or minus pancreas infection rates by 50%. So they went from 29% to 12%. And that probably has something to do with the fluid mobilization along with uh, better uh, control of the leg edema, the weight gain, and the urine output. And um, I think that transplant incisional surgical site healing was higher with the gecko uh, versus standard of care. And this goes back to uh, the device healing the venous ulcers faster as well. On the next slide, just to conclude the edema portion of this, uh, generalized edema, often above the knee and bilateral, you have to think of cardiac and it's congestive cart failure or uh, poor cardiac output states, renal failure or renal compromise, hepatic disease, and you can get ascites um, even up into the abdomen and you should look at that. Nutritional deficiencies and one of the big problems in wound care and post-op is getting enough protein in people. And uh, certainly, you know, albumin's not always your best measure. Endocrine conditions, hypothyroidism, pregnancy, you know, that's all in obesity, is causing outflow obstruction. Hypothyroidism is more the mix edema. Medications, um, on the neck, go back a minute. Go back, yeah. Um, you're looking at estrogen, steroids, vasodilators, calcium antagonists, and non steroidal anti-inflammatories, which can also put the blood pressure up. Local disease is probably much more related to venous or arterial, the infection, cellulitis, uh, inflammatory states, and although hypersensitivity, calf muscle pump dysfunction if the ankle isn't working well. And venous obstruction and lymphatic obstruction, venous insufficiency, the most common is valves that uh, have incompetence and the blood flows back towards the feet. Thrombophlebitis can be superficial or deep. Chronic lymphangitis. And every time you get an infection with lymphedema, you destroy some more lymphatics. Uh, previous limb trauma and surgery or radiation. So it's important to separate the two and assess above and below the knee, bilateral, unilateral, and try to hone in on treating the cause as well as considering compression. And just very quickly on the next slide, and these are courtesy of Kathy Burroughs, uh, morbid obesity, you may have to get custom garments to fit above uh, the knee. Sometimes we use a knee brace, uh, which you can put on first an elastic one, put the compression stockings on up to the knee brace, and it carries the fluid above uh, the knee. Uh, sometimes we use edema wear or tubi grip to do this, and sometimes uh, we use bandaging like the unapace boot, or which is the zinc oxide boot. Next. Here, uh, you see fluid distribution above the knee and foot caused from compression wraps. And, you know, you want a taper and it should be two centimeters below the posterior knee. This was a little high. There is some inflammation, maybe even infection here. And uh, you might have to ease off the compression and treat the other elements, but do something uh, so that you can get around that band. And, one of the things is to get um, compression stockings with grip or to use two lower stockings, one that goes knee high and one that goes on top of that that goes up to the mid thigh. Next. This is one of my pet peeves and things around and below the malleolus, uh, things like the coband two or the cohesive bandages uh, don't have the heel in the first layer. And this is where the zinc oxide boot may help you with the balloon foot or to get adequate compression here or using a bolster at right angles, going by 
makeup sponges from the dollar store. And uh, this can help uh, to relieve that kind of edema. Next one. We have reviewed the handheld Doppler and I think it's got advantages and um, uh, we really should be moving towards this modality rather than the much longer and uh, troubled traditional AVPI. We've explored the toolkit, the VIPs, uh, vascular Doppler infection and uh, looking at plantar pressure redistribution which I didn't cover in a lot of detail, but we can supply the cheap and cheerful, and this helps enhance capacity. And we've integrated new teaks into practice and uh, considered the gecko, which I think could be very useful for some of the troublesome wounds and uh, the stalled wounds. And last slide. Thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you. And it's uh, impressive how much we were able to get get through there. And uh, I know we're just a little bit over time here, but we do have some great questions um, that, that we're going to get to. So for those who are able to stick on with us and you do have a question, feel free to pop it into the Q&A uh, toolbox there. Uh, the, the first thing I was hoping uh, to, to ask you, Dr. Sibold, is a question from uh, Carolyn, who's asking about uh, breaking up biofilm um, that can cover wounds. Is there a, a best, pro uh, best pro uh, process that you would suggest, uh, Carolyn, take when breaking up that biofilm? Uh, one of the things is uh, lowering the pH. The other is using, uh, there are a number of antiseptics that have surface active agents, and that helps. The third thing is biofilms like surfaces of different viscosity. So regular debridement, even if it is um, a conservative uh, sharp debridement, and I think that's the correct NSWOC term, I hope, um, will help to uh, break down biofilms. But if you don't do anything and, uh, you know, are you, um, after your compress, try scrubbing the biofilm off, but you put the same dressing on, it's going to come back again within a day or two. And uh, I think you have to be careful to create the right environment. And, you know, when I spray, um, if I use chlorhexidine mouthwash off-label, Peridex, or I use PHMB, Prontosan, I leave it on. I don't wash it off because uh, these are helping. They actually kill the cell membrane. Um, other things um, will actually lower the pH, uh, like acetic acid, um, of 0.5 or 1%, uh, 5% acetic acid diluted, 1 in 5 or 1 in 10, um, or using uh, the various antiseptic agents that are acidic. Fantastic. Thank you for going into detail there. Appreciate it. Um, I'm seeing there's a, quite a few people who are asking whether the presentation should be recorded. How can we access these? Um, yes, absolutely. It'll be available in the next couple of days. We'll send an email out uh, to all registrants, but this will be existing as a recording on demand on our website. So no worries there. We had a great question in the chat here and we're going back to Gecko. Um, what, what's the patient feedback been on Gecko in terms of comfort, tolerability, any pain, anything like that? Um. There are a very, very few patients that don't like the twitch response, but other than that, uh, the pain is usually decreased, not increased. And the twitch response and, you know, activating, and there's probably three muscles involved. Um, and I think that, you know, the, it's uh, really a very, very effective uh, modality. And I think, though, that you got to get in venous ulcers the compression right. You're not going to use it if you've got such poor vascular supply that you can't induce um, a, uh, if you like, a flush response. And But in people with borderline vasculature um, and you're waiting for a bypass or dilation or they're not candidates for a procedure, I think it's a great modality. And seeing what it did in those post-operative wounds, um, I think it's a device that we need some more experience with. We're probably going to get that experience. And I do have a conflict in that um, I was the proposed principal investigator uh, with this uh, device if we were going to do a venous leg ulcer study like Keith's in Canada. 
Thank you. And you have a great question here from someone who works in uh, in home care. They're mentioning that uh, there's a tedious and long form for lower leg assessments, and they feel that nurses are uh, sometimes not doing this because of uh, how long and tedious the form is. Do you have any words of wisdom to take back to home care to encourage the 60 second assessment and handheld Doppler value? Yeah, and I think we've incorporated it into, and when you download the wound bed prep uh, 2024. It is essentially with the tools we've used in there uh, for your assessments to be less tedious. And you know, when we do our echo reports, if you listen to echo, you will see how we document that. And we send out the reports so that our assessments fit on a page or a page and a half. And uh, they include all the components in the patient and diagnoses and everything else. So I think that we do need to simplify it. And one of the, and uh, this person um, is a fan of, or a friend of mine, but uh, there is a tool that has 15 parameters you measure, but probably three or four out of the Bate Jensen tool are the key ones that you need to do in the assessments um, on a regular basis. And uh, the, uh, the in-low tool, uh, we had to simplify in Guyana. And, you know, Canada's got the lowest rate of assessing for the high-risk diabetic foot of all the Western company, uh, countries. And I think we've got to smarten up and uh, simplify the procedures. So that's why healthcare system change is number 10 on the new wooden bed prep paradigm. Thank you for touching on that. And just going back to what you were mentioning about that, uh, the, the very infrequent reports of the twitch sensation. Uh, Sherry, who's an NSWOC with us, was mentioning that they've had patients use it and they get used to the twitch sensation very quickly. So she's had some good experience with that as well. And a lot um, of other people, including us, have as well. Yeah, fantastic. And I see the question has been asked a couple of times here in the chat. I know we have Jeff Forney in the background answering it. Uh, people are asking about the $750 cost for two weeks. And again, because of the, the big cost savings that's coming from faster healing, I don't know if you wanted to touch on that for a second, Jeff. No, I think it, it, it because uh, up front, it, it looks like it's a high price. But uh, the reality is that a lot of these patients have been on service for months, if not years. And if you can cut down the healing time by half, then it's a, a huge savings. And um, the, the the feedback we continue to get is that, uh, you know, for the patient, it's it's a, it's a big deal. And uh, to the healthcare system, the economics, we have a health e uh, economist that's uh, um, analyzing this actually from your hometown, uh, Troy, in, in Ottawa. And the bottom line is that he's not found a single scenario where uh, Gecko doesn't make sense economically. Fantastic. Well, thank you for touching on that. I know it was coming up. Did you want to just touch on as well about um, uh, insurance and coverage? Yeah, the, the insurance side is an area that we have not put any time into because uh, we're a small company. And uh, the bottom line is that this is, this is a uh, medical expense that uh, the government should be covering as, as part of our healthcare system. Um, and, uh, uh, so, so we've we've not really spent any time digging into the uh, the insurance companies of the world, if you wish. No worries. Well, thank you for touching on that. Uh, anyways, here and I know we have quite a few questions about uh, the one page or assessment form. We're asking about the links to the documents in the in the in the kit as well, um, and as well as the links to practice uh, listening to the Doppler sounds as well. Um, are, Dr. Sibyl, I don't know. Are there? Uh, uh, easy links available that maybe we could send after the uh, fact. We can probably link them uh, to, um, it'll take us a week or so because Andrew's away, but uh, we can link them uh, to some of the Woundpedia resources that we're using for the people that take the skills test. And we've got about 10 Doppler sounds people can listen to. There are a number of them on YouTube, though, if you uh, Google that. And if you listen, um, the one thing that we can easily link you to is Dieter Meyer did a 15 minute video for me uh, from his clinic uh, showing the various sounds and how easy this test is to do. And we can certainly link you or you might be able to pull it up just by putting Dieter Meyer's name in. But uh, Troy, when you send the uh, thing through, 
uh, we can make sure we put a link into that video. Okay, well, we'll definitely follow up there and, and try to get that out to everybody. And uh, they're just mentioning as well as the kit available to be purchased online? Uh, not yet. Um, we may um, uh, do that. We're trying to get the Ministry of Health in Ontario uh, gave us money to buy 100. And uh, we are looking at, and it's very attractive now that we're a registered charity, it's very attractive to patients to uh, buy and donate a kit. They seem to feel that's much better than some of the other uses for which uh, you may donate to help wound care. And those kits are about $1,200 with the pieces that we're putting together in them. But they really, I think, can make you much more self-sufficient in your community. And we will be developing consensus statements on the audible Doppler, uh, the oral antibiotics for infection, and the planter pressure redistribution devices. And you will see those published in advances over the next six to 12 months. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry, can I come back to a question you asked earlier about insurance? Um, uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, Expendicare, a long-term care organization, has uh, purchased the product for a large number of their homes and their plan is to roll it out to all of them. And uh, it's also on formulary in BC and about half of Ontario currently funds it and a number of other provinces have uh, provided the device. So while it's not insurance, I, I, I was focused more on the insurance question, the, the, the great, uh, great uh, West uh, type example. Uh, it, it actually is covered by a lot of government sources across Canada. I just want to emphasize two things, Jeff. One is that in Keith's study, uh, they used it relatively early uh, so that these ulcers after four weeks, yes. um, if they weren't in a healing trajectory, they got it. But we certainly are encouraging interprofessional assessments and a bigger look at week eight. One of the problems yep. is when a wound becomes really chronic and you get a lot of woody fibrosis in venous ulcers, they're much more difficult to heal exactly. uh, than if we were to catch and to implement this earlier on within the course. And this is yep. what ECHO is all about, is um, uh, trying to train people in teams to do what we're doing and to create subhubs around Ontario and then we see that spreading more widely. And one of the things we're working on now is the Indigenous community, as I showed in that slide. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly back to your earlier point, uh, Dr. Sibold, I think uh, much like a lot of things in medicine, if you catch them early, you, you can get far better outcomes. Yeah. And I'll just echo what Natalie's saying that they're thinking of uh, using it as an application in uh, palliative care just for the comfort factor as well. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, we're uh, looking like we're getting a little bit over time here. So what we'll do is if you have any other questions, you can see on the you can see on the screen there. If you have questions for Jeff, you can definitely send over an email to Perfuse MedTech. You can see it on screen there. As we mentioned, we'll do our best to get you um, some resources after the fact once we have a recording available and we'll get in touch with Dr. Sybil and your team over there. Uh, to send that back to you. But I just want to say thank you so much to, to both yourself, of course, Dr. Sybil. It's an amazing presentation as always. Everyone's saying thank you in, uh, in the chat about that. And of course, thank you to Perfuse MedTech, to you, Jeff, to your team behind the scenes here as well. Um, this couldn't have been done without you. So we really, really appreciate it. And then uh, I know this won't be the last time we'll see you too. In fact, at our national conference, Dr. Sybil is going to be there in a couple different capacities with our dermatology program, uh, with a couple of uh, presentations during the regular uh, conference program as well. So that's just my little shout out to go check out some information about our conference as well. But uh, on behalf of NSWOC, I want to thank both of you again, and we hope that everybody on here has a great rest of the evening.